Here we go. So that's the little logo for National Poetry Day today, the 7th of October 2021. And the theme this year is choice. And so I've been choosing which poems I wanted to read aloud to you. Um, and it's something very new for me because although I'm an author, um, being a poet is a kind of special kind of author, really. It's a special kind of activity that somebody who writes for a living does. Um, so what I've mainly been doing the last few years is writing novels, writing fiction for children. So I'm, a, I'm known as a children's author. And my first book, Sea Bean, originally came out in 2013, so eight years ago. And um, it was, it's a trilogy, so there's three books in that series. And they're now out as one big thick book called the Sea Bean Trilogy. Um, and then uh, last year, a, a book that I wrote for teenagers came out as well called Chameleon. Uh, so those are my main two things that I've been working on. And, and then during lockdown, I was working on doing the audio book for Sea Bean, which is now available. And um, as I say, launching, launching Chameleon and writing the next book that I'm doing, which is going to be called Black Loop. But somewhere in the middle of all that, I found myself starting to write some poems. And I don't know whether that was the effect of lockdown, um, but it, it kind of started to sort of happen anyway, slowly but surely. And um, one of the things that I started to think about when I realised that um, I had a kind of whole collection of poems and I, I thought, well, I need to put these together. And when you put them together, it's called an anthology. And, and that was also part of the creative part of the process because you have to decide when you put together a poetry anthology, which poems are gonna be included and which ones you're not gonna include and which ones are gonna go opposite each other on the page and which order to put them in and whether to illustrate them and all those kinds of things. So these were new kind of creative challenges for me. But as I began to realize that I had the makings of a book of poems, and I started to try them out on friends and family and so on and got quite a good reaction from them. So I was kind of confident that maybe I could put these out as a set of poems. It made me think about what are my kind of ingredients that I could share with you. Um, I'm going to read to you the poem that's called, the title poem that's called How to Write a Poem in a moment or two. But first of all, I wanted to reflect on what the ingredients are that I like to work with when I'm writing a poem, because I thought that might help you. And um, there's sort of five things really. And the main thing is we've got to get over this feeling. And that feeling is what I call, you know, staring at the blank piece of paper. And you've probably all done that when you've been set a task in your classrooms and you're thinking, oh, you know, you're just scratching your head and you're at that stage where somehow the blank piece of paper, it, it just like washes your mind clean, doesn't it? And you kind of think, what am I going to write? What is it that's in my head? So you have to sort of start with some strategies and I realized that poems could come from all sorts of different directions. Um, and these are the things that I think it boils down to. So the first one is funny feelings. So you know when you've got a funny feeling and you're feeling a bit uncomfortable or maybe you're feeling a little bit excited or a little bit, I don't know, a little bit worried maybe. All of those feelings, we can turn them into poems. If you just kind of sit and think about them for a little while and think, how does this feeling feel in my body or has it made me say something that I didn't want to say or is it making me is it stopping me from saying something that I would like to say but what is this funny feeling doing inside me and is it having an effect on me like as a, physically is it making my heart beat faster is it doing things to my body and those funny feelings can be turned into a poem and then sometimes you find that when you've written the poem the funny feeling is, has gone away the uncomfortable feeling or whatever so that's one ingredient that you could work with. And I guarantee that we have several cases a day of funny feelings. The second thing can be that you see something, you see a powerful picture, you see something as you're walking to school or you see something on TV or maybe it's in a computer game or something and it just gives you a little idea and it just somehow your brain seems to store it away and you, you think to yourself, that might be useful or that might be something that can inspire me to do something, or that's made me think about things in a new way. And maybe the powerful pictures given you the funny feeling in the first place and made you feel really kind of happy in some way or really excited. So powerful pictures can work. Sometimes you can just flick through a book in the library and stop when you get to something that just kind of holds your attention a little moment longer than the other photos and ask yourself, why is it that I'm drawn to looking at this picture and not the other ones so much? 
And something in that might give you an idea for a poem. Now, of course, probably what your teachers would say is it all starts with the words, but I think it sort of starts a little bit before you get to words and words are just the way that you translate that feeling, that poem, your inner poet inside you needs some words to get it outside of you, to put it down on paper so you can share it to, with somebody else, so you can read it to them. So words are really, really important and particular kinds of words. Sometimes we think we need to use really, really long words or something or complicated words in a poem. But I think wild and willful words are probably all we need. Wild words are kind of words that aren't afraid to say what they mean. And willful, I suppose, means something similar that they've kind of got a mind of their own and they've just got to kind of be organized into a certain order um, so that you can make sense of it as a poem. And sometimes a poem doesn't have to be written in complete sentences. It doesn't have to have all the rules. It doesn't have to follow all the rules that you usually follow to do with spelling and punctuation and grammar because it's got its own world inside a poem and it's up to you how you arrange it on the page and whether those words have capital letters and full stops and whether you start a new line or not. And then the last two ingredients that I like to think about when I'm writing a poem are the sound that it's going to make because hopefully you're going to read it aloud. That's one of the really fun things about, about poetry, isn't it? Um, is hearing someone else reading a poem to you. And sometimes it's the, the sounds, the alliteration and the magic of the kind of the, the language that comes through just at the level of a sound. And then of course, the other thing apart from sounds that's really important, not only in poems, but also in music is when there's a silence. And those silences in a poem can sometimes be very meaningful and, and tell you more about the poem than the words themselves. So those are the five ingredients that I like to work with. And um, maybe that's given you something to think about. Maybe it's giving you a new starting point when you start to sit down and write a poem. And now I'd like to, if, you, if I may, read you a few of the poems from this brand new book. And I'm gonna show you because I've got this background going, it sometimes disappears, you know, so if I go like that, but you only see little bits of the book, but that's the real book. It's just a little thin book, a lot thinner than my other books. So Seabean is, Seabean is quite a long story. So that's that, that thick and Chameleon's about that thick. But when you write poems, obviously they're very short. They're like miniature stories. Um, so I'm going to read some aloud to you. And as I said, the, um, one of the decisions you have to make is what you're going to call your collection of poems. And I'd written this poem called How to Write a Poem. So I thought it'd be funny if I called the whole collection How to Write a Poem and some other poems. So if you're the sort of person that likes to just listen to poems, then go ahead and just close your eyes and just let it all wash over you. But if you're somebody that's a bit more sort of like a visual learner, and you like to see how it looks on the page, then there you have it on the screen in front of you. How to write a poem. You write the first line and decide if you like it. Then another idea pings inside your head and you try to write it down quickly before it runs away. Then you leave a little space. You don't have to if you don't want to. And maybe try to use an interesting word like mellifluous. You can cross out the interesting words later if they don't sound right. It's sometimes licorice to use a word, but not in the way it's supposed to be. Adults never seem to agree about whether a poem should rhyme. So try and mix it up a bit and don't rhyme all the time. Some poems get a proper ending and some just end. So hopefully that will give you some clues when you're writing poems. You can always go back to that one and think about what it means for you. Now, the next one is just eight lines long. And I wanted to get across um, four characters in somebody's life. It's actually a made up person um, and how they relate to them and what it feels like, I guess, to live at their house. Um, and I challenged myself to write it in a very, very sort of short, short way. So it's a little bit like a haiku or something, isn't it? It's got different syllables and different verse lengths, but it's got that sense of being very short. So home life. Mum says, make your bed, but I don't want to. Dad says, blow your nose, but I say no. Joe says, grow up, but I'm not ready yet. Nan says, 
Come here, but give me a hug. And I thought that poem was probably quite important as a lockdown poem because lots of us didn't get hugs from our grandparents, did we? Um, while we weren't allowed to see them. So that's sort of got a bit of a kind of bittersweet um, sound to it now, I think, uh, with the uh, perspective of lockdown. Now, these are a couple of fun, fun, uh, uh, fun poems. Who's got a dog? Put up your hands if you've got a dog. Oh yeah, I see a few people. Who's got a sister, an older sister? Oh, a few people with older sisters. Well, you're gonna be able to relate to these. Who's got a dog and an older sister? Okay, you're definitely gonna to relate to these poems then. So the first one's called Dogs in Cars. Dogs love cars, they really do. They love jumping into the boot. They love steaming up the windows. They love finding stale crisps. They love making muddy paw prints on the seats. And most of all, they love sticking their head out of the window and letting the air lick their tongue as it whooshes past. So have you got dogs that do that? Okay, the next one is about older sisters. This one's called Sister Selfie. And um, it's got another one of my illustrations beside it, you'll see there. My sister Carly has spots, but no one knows because she hides them under her makeup. It takes a long time to put on and lots of sponges and brushes, sometimes a few bad words too. But every morning when she's done, her face shines and shimmers, her eyelashes crimped and curled, her cheeks blushing and blooming, and her lips pout as she takes a selfie. So those people who've got older sisters, have you seen your sister do that? Teenagers are always taking selfies, aren't they? Making funny faces. I think it's hilarious. Okay, these are the next two. Oh, this is the next one, actually. Now, this one is about my, my daughter, who, when she was about your age, she suddenly had to go to hospital because there was something the matter with her, and we didn't know what it was. And um, it's happened a couple more times since then now. She's 17 now. And um, I think that sometimes you can write a poem because it can help you come to terms with something that you don't yet understand. And I think this poem, for me, is, is about that. So it's called Jumpy Heart. My heart is jumpy today, going crazy inside my chest. It does that sometimes, but they never know why. The nurses get these stickers out to stick all over me, and then they clip on coloured wires, but I never know why. Doctors ask me questions and listen to my heart with a cold circle. The machine spits out jagged mountains, but they don't know why. The room is full of beeping and lots of things on wheels, the lines go weirdly up and down, but I don't know why. They give me pills and puffers and plastic cups of water. It's like something's going to happen, but they don't know why. So me and my jumpy heart decide to have a talk. I ask it why it's being crazy, but it doesn't know why. I tell it lots of stories and my heart starts listening. It's still a little stroppy though, and I don't know why. The machine beside my bed stops beeping and the mountains are more like hills now. They still don't know why. The nurses take away the wires and say I can go home. Now my heart is feeling quieter. If only we knew why. So that's kind of a poem about a bit of a mystery as well. It doesn't have to be a medical mystery. It could be anything really, couldn't it? Anything you don't quite understand that's happening in your life. Okay, who's seen the movie Home Alone? There's several movies, aren't there? Yeah, it's great, isn't it? So this is my take on that. And it's about a child who thinks that they would do things a bit differently if they were in that movie. If I was in that movie, I'd have way more fun. The house would be made of sweets, just like in Hansel and Gretel. So it wouldn't matter if the fridge was empty. I'd invite Red Riding Hood over and then put on my scariest Halloween costume so it wouldn't matter if the wolf rang the doorbell. We'd play the Hobbit on the Xbox and I'd wear my wizard's hat. So it wouldn't matter if the dragon blew fire down the chimney. We'd pile up the cushions under the kitchen table and make a monster nest to sleep in. 
So it wouldn't matter if Sully tried to scare us in the night. And when we woke up, Red Riding Hood would call her grandma on WhatsApp to check she was okay. Now the next one is something you might like to try in your classroom because I tried to write a poem where I didn't use a letter E. And the reason I did this was I heard that there was a, a French writer called Georges Perec who managed to write a whole novel without using the letter E. And then the person who translated it into English also had to do the same thing. They had to translate it and not use the letter E either. So on Monday, when I did an in-person workshop, I had six tables and obviously there's only five vowels. So we had a table who wrote a poem without the letter A and then one who did like I did without a letter E and then I, O and U. And then the children decided that the other letter to make the sixth table should be S. So that's another one you could try out is not using the letter S and, and see what happens because what, what usually happens is you come up with words that have the lettering you're not allowed to use, and then you have to think of a different word. So it makes you be a bit more kind of flexible about the words. And then sometimes you choose a different way of saying something that you weren't expecting to, and it, it helps you to write the poem a bit more quickly, even though it seems like something you've got to uh, get around, like an obstacle, it actually helps the poem happen more easily, funnily enough. So this one's called A Lazy Story. So if you just think, that the, the title is A Lazy Story, that doesn't have an E in it, but as some children pointed out to me, when you include the bit in brackets with no letter E, then there is an E there somewhere, isn't there? But I couldn't call it a lazy poem because of course the word poem has an E, doesn't it? What I want in this world is to do nothing, to say nothing, to try nothing, to just sit and wait for tomorrow. If you said I was making it up, I'd say, you don't know what I'm thinking. If you said, it's hard to do nothing, I'd say, why not just try? And you might find out too what you want most in this world. And after I'd written it, I realized that it was a poem about getting bored. And sometimes getting bored seems like something that you don't want to do. And then sometimes it's quite nice because when you're in the middle of being bored, you suddenly get an idea about what you really, really want to do, don't you? So that's a lazy story. The next one is a bit of a joke poem about where do you put apostrophes? So it's called Apostrophe Catastrophe. And it doesn't really make sense unless you look at it written down because it's all about where the apostrophes go, isn't it? You're right, they're sorry. Are you sure that's all? You're right, they're sorry. I'm not sure at all. Let's see if you're right. It's your right to know. Let's see if they're sorry, because they're sorry is just an apology, that's all. Now, one of the things that um, I'm known for is writing something called cli-fi. That's the genre that my books fall into. And cli-fi is short for climate fiction. And so my books are um, about climate change, I suppose. You know, they're there are books where climate change is something that makes the story happen and it's a big part of the story. So I thought I should challenge myself to write a cli-fi poem. So this next one is, is just that, it's a cli-fi poem called Wrong Names. If Iceland is green and Greenland is icy, shouldn't they just switch? Call Iceland Greenland and Greenland Iceland and make new maps. It might take a while to sink in, for the new names to sink in. That's what I'm worried about. And what if Iceland gets icy and Greenland melts because of climate change? They'd have to switch their names back to what they were before. So maybe there's something that you've been puzzled about that seems to have the names the wrong way around and you could maybe write a poem about that. Okay, so the next one is about a conversation. It's a poem that's really a conversation between a curious child and a very irritable dad. And maybe you'll recognize something of one of your parents in this. I know that in our family, we have a little joke that um, if we want to ask dad to get something down from the attic, we have to give him about three days notice or he gets really grumpy. So this one's called In the Loft. 
What's up there, Dad? All sorts of rubbish. Why is it dark up there? Because the light bulb broke. Why does the ladder make funny noises? Because it hates me going up there. What are you looking for? Something your mother wants down. Do you know where it is? No. Is it up there, Dad? Your mother says it is. How are you going to find it? Well, it's up there somewhere. Is it with the Christmas decorations? I jolly well hope not. Is it in a box with a label on it? Not in a million years. Can I climb the ladder and help you look? No. How many people have been in their attic and climbed up that ladder? Oh, you're, you're brave. I was used to find it really hard to get off the ladder at the top because you felt really high up. Do you not get worried? <laughs> you're all very brave. Okay, uh, the next one is called TV Animals. Uh, do, you, do you like watching nature programs? Do you like watching David Attenborough programs? Yeah, a few people into animals. Who likes animals? We all like animals, don't we? And we, we all want them to be to be in nature where they should be. So this is a poem about what are we being shown when we, when we look at animals on the TV? And um, well, you'll, you'll get the idea, it's called TV animals. TV animals roam the land, carefree and strong. They have plenty to eat and somewhere to live and they don't die. TV animals groom each other, perfect and happy. They belong to prides and herds they feed and wash and preen, and they don't die. But what happens to TV animals when they turn the cameras off? When a monkey gets stuck? When a gazelle goes hungry? When an antelope gets attacked and they die? So that's something to think about, isn't it? Because if you were that cameraman and you were filming some animals who couldn't find water or somebody that, an animal that had been injured because it had been attacked, what would you do? Would you carry on filming it or would you go and help it? Because um, that's a bit of a dilemma, isn't it, for somebody who's a, a wildlife photographer or cameraman. Okay, these are my last two now. And um, we, going back to the people who've got dogs, did you have your dogs, put up your hands if you had your dogs when they were a puppy? So you know all about puppies then? Who would like a puppy? Oh yeah, who wouldn't like a puppy, eh? Well, one time it happened to us, my parents uh, had a dog that had puppies. And so this is sort of a story where I remember about that. And it's called Last Christmas. Last Christmas, Bella gave birth. It was just like Jesus, but instead of a baby, there were six puppies on Christmas morning. Bundles of joy, Nana called them pain in the neck moaned my dad while mum and I just stared in wonder can we keep them shall we name them will Bella feed them do we need them that's enough now let's leave them be last Christmas opening presents eating turkey and stuffing and too many chocolates was nothing compared to Bella's puppies And then the last one, I had to write a poem called Sea Bean, didn't I? Because a lot of people ask me what, what's inspired me to write my first ever children's book, Sea Bean. And it was one of those little seeds that you find um, sometimes on a beach in this country. And they floated a very, very long way across the ocean from um, a long way away. And this poem tells you that story. Um, so I wanted to kind of capture the story about the sea bean as a, an actual thing from nature in a poem. Sea bean. Cloud forest flower, big as a chandelier, opens its petals and bats fly in. Long bean pod, big as a sword, snaps open and beans fall out. Shiny sea bean, small as a pebble, floats across the sea and lands on a beach. Clever sea bean has not forgotten cracks open and sends out roots. So I hope I've been sending out some roots to you about writing poems. Um, so here are the three books and that's my 
website, sarah-holding.com. And I'm hoping now, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, that you might have some questions for me that I can try and answer.